Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Today's guest, Robert Rufkin, is an entrepreneur on a mission to help everyone find their place in the world. He's the founder and CEO of Compass, a real estate technology company that just went public in April. Robert has the kind of resume that will exhaust you. Raised by a single mother, he graduated from Columbia in two and a half years. He earned an MBA from Columbia Business School and worked at McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, and as a White House fellow before starting Compass. He's run 50 marathons in 50 states to raise $1 million for charities, including For America Needs You, a nonprofit he founded to serve young people living below the poverty line who are the first in their families to go to college. Today, we talk about his new book, No One Succeeds Alone. Robert shares his personal journey of finding his place in the world the leadership principles that have guided his success and his dream big mentality. Let's dig in. Here's my conversation with Compass founder and CEO, Robert Rafkin. Robert, what a treat to have you on. Thank you. You're a busy man. Thanks for taking a minute. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So, you know, your entrepreneurial drive, right, and and, and clearly uh, this dream big mentality started with you at a really early age. Tell us a little bit about some of your earliest ventures and really what unlocked this mindset right inside of you. Well, what unlocked the mindset, again, the dream big mindset, growth mindset, you can do anything that you put your your mind to um, you know, perspective. It's really my mom. My mom was an immigrant from Israel, and she moved to the U.S., to New York, uh, and then her parents were very, very strict, and so she, she left New York uh, and went to Berkeley, California, uh, and on the way there, she went to Woodstock, and for anyone who's older, you know, they always say, well, we didn't know Woodstock was Woodstock at the time. Like, it was just a, it was just a concert, but it turned out to be, you know, Woodstock, and uh, <laughs> Then, then she, you know, in Berkeley, California, she met my dad, who was an African American from the South, went there to play jazz, um, and they had me. And the day uh, they had me, my mom called um, her grandparents and said, "Hey, I just, uh, I have a kid, uh, baby. I want to let you know." And they only asked one question, which was, "What is he?" And uh, my mom said, "He is Jewish and black." Uh, at that point, they disowned her, never spoke to her again. Also, my, my father abandoned us uh, a couple months later. So it's really just the, the two of us our entire life. And so the reason I say she gave me this, this dream big mindset is because I saw her fail again and again and again in life, deal with bankruptcy, deal with rejection from her parents, deal with bad relationships with men. But she always moved forward. Yeah, and it, she made it very clear that yeah, you know, that with an entrepreneurial spirit, you can always realize your success. It's not always easy, but you can do it. And now, uh, an, an agent at Compass, right? Which we're going to dig into. Let me ask you this: How did you learn to deal with? Because I would imagine there was some anger there, right? Like, and 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 the loss, and and how did you channel that? How did you deal with that? I learned early um, to not hold a grudge. I think holding a grudge can only hurt you. It, it literally cannot do anything good for you. <laughs> and so I took the perspective, my grandparents, they're the ones who missed out, right? That was, that was a perspective I had. Uh, and with, with my father, you know, my mom always told me something about my dad. And I always knew it wasn't true, but I, I chose to believe it anyway. <laughs> and I think it helped, you know, it helped me not hold a grudge. What she told me is your father left because he didn't want you to be like him. Uh, you know, he, he, unfortunately, he ended up doing the kind of drugs you don't come back from. Uh, and he ultimately, uh, he, he, you know, I only remember seeing him once. Uh, it was after, you know, my mom got a promotion at, at, a, at a job. We went out to celebrate at a diner, had some waffles and 
a homeless guy walks by and she runs out and brings him back in and says, you know, this is your dad. And, and that's the only time I, I remember him a year later, he, he died and I was in, uh, in elementary school. And, uh, I share that because, you know, he, you know, he had a lot of, a lot of challenges and I think he, he was the kind of guy where if the world told him he wasn't, he wasn't good enough, it really hurt him. He wasn't able to bounce back. And so again, I, just, I share all that because you know, my mom made, made me feel like, hey, by him not being there, by him choosing not to be with me, it had protected me from some of, some of the, the character traits that I, I potentially would have adopted from him. It's an unbelievable story. Wow. A lot of your environment growing up, right, from your early education uh, to the world of finance to the world of tech, right, it lacked diversity. How, how did you navigate that, right, and how does it shape how you lead now, you know, particularly, right, as a black CEO, right, in tech? Well, there's a lot to that question, and there's a lot of... <laughs> I'm sure, man. <laughs> and there's a lot of... It's a loaded run. Go. Sure. I'd say that, you know, one, I believe that your disadvantages are your advantages. I, I believe that, you know, things that are bad can are also good, and so I always put things to positive. So in this sense, being I was always forced to be uncomfortable, which over time... I was able to learn to be comfortable anywhere, right? I remember I was, I was black and Jewish, so I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a synagogue and I'm the only black person. I mean, that, that, that's pretty hardcore training. <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> yeah, no you're doubt. Like, you're, you're, you're like 11 years old, 10 years old. You know, you're going through like a, a bar mitzvah, <laughs> you know, training, and like you're the one black guy there. And then you know, your, your mom's white. Everyone thinks you're adopted. Like, it's, there's a lot of like stuff going on. And then, you know, I could be. You know, with my black friends, but I'm, you know, but I'm, I'm mixed and, and, you know, they may see me in a different way. You know, they may, they may share sentiments that make me don't feel like I fully belong there either. And so over time, you know, I got into a, a private school on scholarship uh, for high school. I commuted two hours each way. And I was almost always the only black kid in a classroom. Um, yeah. Same at, at, at Columbia, same where I worked at McKinsey or, or at Lazard or Goldman Sachs. And so I, I think I became comfortable in my own skin and being uncomfortable. Now, in terms of what's it like to now that I'm, I'm a leader of a company, I deeply, deeply care about creating an environment where everyone feels like they belong. Uh, I believe you cannot be your best self unless you're your authentic self. And it's really hard. We, you know, we do a lot in the company and reinforce that sentiment in as many ways as we can. Uh, to make sure that, you know, regardless of your race, gender, socioeconomic background, in any area, like you should feel completely confident and know that at Compass, you belong, whether you're an employee or an agent, you know, we like you just the way you are. And you talk about that a lot in the book, which I think is so cool. It's a great read, right? No one succeeds alone. Amen to that, right? So true. Robert, I've heard you talk about the idea for Compass, right, and how it came about. But but can you share with our listeners, when did you decide to actually make that leap and pursue it? So I spent the first 10 years of my career out of college in the traditional corporate world. Uh, again, McKinsey and Lazard and Goldman Sachs, I worked as a White House fellow. And towards the, the end, it was in my 20s, I started a nonprofit called America Needs You which helps students who are first in their families to go to college and below the poverty line, giving them career development, college support, and two summer internships. I loved it. And I got you know, 20 of my friends at different companies to join. We all, uh, we all found young, a young leadership board member, and they all found mentor coaches. And every other Saturday over the course of two years for each class, we would spend eight hours mentoring. It was just, I loved it. And when I was 29, uh, somebody asked me, a guy named Cyrus Masumi, who was founder and CEO of a company called ZocDoc, he said, Robert, do you think about your job in the shower? <laughs> <laughs> I laughed at him. I was like, of course not. What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, well, if you don't think about your job in the shower, it means you don't love it enough to ever be your best self. And that really, that really stuck with me that, that, because I, I I'd worked so hard for success and to create a better life 
for the family that I would once build that it really made it hard to say, like, I, I, he was right. I would never be my best self. And I started to think, what did I think about in the shower? I was always thinking about America needs you every, every, day, every morning. <laughs> I was thinking about these kids yeah. and how we could work to give them more opportunity. And that's where I said, okay, I have to find a career path where I love it as much as I love America needs you. And that you think about in the shower, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> then I, at the time I was chief of staff to the president of Goldman Sachs and we were traveling around the world, meeting a constant rotation of global CEOs. And the most consistent theme was technology is transforming my entire industry. It was probably an 80% of the conversations unprompted uh, that would come up by the CEO. And uh, simultaneously, there was, uh, there was this article called Software is Eating the World by, uh, I, I think it was Andreessen Horowitz. And it talked about how technology is transforming every industry. Uh, and then you know, on top of that, it's all like in a matter of months. Then I saw a social network. Uh, and I was like, oh, my God. And, and I love movies. I was like, anything's possible. And now with this thing, with software, anyone, you can scale your impact across so many people uh, in such a large way that that wasn't possible before. Uh, and lastly, my friend, Ori Alone, who I met when I was a White House fellow at something called Academy of Achievement, he had sold his first company to Google and he had started another company, which he had sold to Twitter. And I was a business advisor for, for that company. And seeing this person within you know, just over a year with both companies, you know, sell them in that way, I said, hey, Ori, let's come together. I can get the business team. You can hire the, the technology team. And we, could, we can really create something special. And we started talking about you know, what industry it could be in, what the opportunity was. The criteria, what Ori said, is he would consider something if it was a really big industry that touches everyone, that people don't like, and that Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft aren't competing in. So is that <laughs> those three criteria. <laughs> wow. And we, we, we looked at, you know, there were healthcare, education, in real estate, we ultimately chose real estate um, because that was closer to our, our hearts. And my mom was a real estate agent and we had all tried to rent apartments. In the beginning, it was just rentals. And then the, the rest was, was kind of history. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's awesome to hear you talk about it. And, and, and you know, it's a tech company, right? And so for our listeners who aren't yet familiar, right, how is Compass different from, you know, your traditional real estate brokerage? or And, and, and what differentiated Compass from other startups, right, in this space is so significant, obviously, considering what you've done in such short order. We started off as just rentals only. And we had this uh, idea of creating neighborhood specialists that would, in New York City only, that, that was the scope of our big dream at the time. We're going to transform New York rentals forever. And now, you know, eight years later, we're the largest independent real estate brokerage in the country, s- serving over 20,000 real estate agents in hundreds of cities across the country. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing how much you can do when you have a, a company of very passionate people with big dreams. But the, the beginning was just this neighborhood specialist model. And they were charging half off. And they were employees. And they had red backpacks. Where in the backpacks, we were we had all these things to help with customer service. We had breath mints, we had umbrellas, we had battery chargers, we even had shoe shiner, <laughs> just in case some, <laughs> someone they were working with had to go back to work. Ultimately, we realized after a year that it was not working. I was out there trying to rent apartments myself and you know, even to my friends, and it, it was clear they weren't looking for a friend just to like help them with nice customer service. They were looking to find the best apartment for them. And the people that knew how to find the best apartments were professional full-time real estate agents that had been doing it for a long time. They knew all the buildings. They knew how to get access. They knew what was going to come online before anyone else. And so I told Ori, my co-founder, I said, look, we have to pivot. And at that time, uh, no one wanted to. They wanted to pursue that dream. And they actually wanted to to fire me. Uh, And so I, I, I go home to my wife and I tell her, uh, look, I, they all want to fire me. And she told me, you know, <laughs> Robert, don't give up, bounce back, bounce back and bounce back the passion. And so I go, I go to Ori, you know, later on and I tell him, look, this is why we have to pivot. 
And he asked two questions, which led to the strategy that we are today. He said, one, if we can, he said, there are 2 million agents in the country. If we can just make them more successful, won't we be successful? I said, yes. Uh, If we can make them, help them grow their business, will we grow our business? Yes. And the second question was, if you're being chased by a bear, you have to be faster than the second person. In this context, who is the second person? And I said, I think it's a brokerage firm. And he said, that would be good because brokerage firms don't move very fast. They don't improve very fast. So long story short, that this is where we are today. And what makes us different uh, is our customers are real estate agents. We want to help them grow and realize their entrepreneurial potential. There are 2 million of them. They are one of the most diverse professions in the country. The largest industry dominated by women. Uh, one of the few industries where over 100,000 women make six figures a year. It's an industry that pushes people in their 60s and 70s to grow and get better. Uh, like my mom, who's 76 years old, still an agent. <laughs> yeah, it's an industry it. of families that work together. Uh, just such a wonderful industry. But it's also the most underserved customer base. These 20,000 agents, it grows every year. And we just ask them, what can we do to help you grow your business, have uh, more time, uh, more so efficiency, and more productivity, uh, and you know, more revenue? The brokerage model 30 years ago was a one-stop shop, was a platform for agents to do their entire job. But over the last 30 years, technology has empowered every profession to accomplish more. And in this context for real estate, it is taken away from the historical traditional brokerage firm model, the majority of the workflow. So now the workflow of the agent is coming, call it 70% outside of the brokerage firm through software, a CRM, digital ads, digital marketing, uh, consumer search, agent MLS search. Uh, I could go on and on, on transaction management software, e-disclosures. I'm not meeting you, the client in the office. I mean you through software. Uh, and then 30% is still happening through the brokerage firm. We're building the modern one-stop stop solution. The modern platform meets the needs of the agent, the traditional needs uh, that a brokerage firm is providing, but also the software needs. And we have a team of 900 uh, person product engineering team that uh, our CTO was CTO of artificial intelligence from Microsoft, Joseph Roche, our chief product officer was head of Amazon uh, Prime Video and, and launched Alexa at Amazon. They were working side by side with agents to meet all their needs. Well, and it's unbelievable because most startups, I think, focused on you know eliminating agents, right? And instead, you focused on empowering them, which is obviously a very different approach than everybody else had taken and it clearly <laughs> worked. I mean, you went from a, you know, kind of a single office in New York, right now into a multi-billion dollar enterprise that, by the way, just went public. You know, leadership can be at some level at the level that you are certainly lonely at the higher that you get, right? Because more information gets filtered right before it gets to you. How do you ensure you stay connected, right? And with the pulse of the organization as it continues and has continued to scale? That's a, another great question, and it's not easy. Let's start with the pulse of the customer, then there's the pulse of the employees. The pulse of the, the customer is uh, we have a, a tool called the feedback tool. Any agent can put in their idea of what they want, not just around technology. It could be around uh, culture, marketing. It could be around which, what new region to launch. Uh, and they put the idea in, and other agents go to up or down. So that lets lets me see the mood of what matters to our customers, our agents. Uh, I also, historically, I would travel and visit every region, uh, you know, every, every, if not month, uh, every other month. Uh, And so really, I spend a lot of time with our our agents and asking them what matters. Uh, In terms of our employees, um, it, it actually is harder. I feel like our agents... And that says in a positive way, they're they're unrelentless in their in their requests for what they want. I think employees on balance, it's harder to to get them to say, like, this is what I want, this isn't working, I need this thing. And so you tend to find out more after the fact when something didn't work as opposed to early on, like this is something that really, really matters. Uh, but that's why you know I focus a lot on on great managers. I think that the best thing you can do as a, a leader is make sure that you have great managers and great manager training. You know, you can always get get better. You can always invest more. 
but I, I think the most sustainable uh, path to success for understanding the mood of your employees is making sure you have great managers. In just a minute, we'll get back to the show. But first, here's a special invitation to join my group coaching community, Game Changer Leadership Huddles. Every month, we explore a different topic to help you grow personally and professionally. Topics range from how to have difficult conversations to energy management to negotiation tips. If you want to be part of a growing community that will challenge and support you on your journey, then sign up today at mollyfletcher.com backslash leadership dash huddles. Again, that's mollyfletcher.com backslash leadership dash huddles. And for our podcast listeners, use the discount code game changer to get special pricing. I can't wait to see you in the huddles. It's so clear, Robert, after after reading your book and, and, and getting into your world more and more that you are so mission driven, right? And I know that, you know, Compass, right, to help everyone find their place in the world. What are some of the ways Compass lives that mission, right? In other words, like as a leader, how how do you ensure that mission is something that everyone lives and breathes, right, in the way that they show up every day? So one, you have to talk about it all the time. So our mission and our values, we call them the Compass entrepreneurship principles, dream big, move fast, learn from reality, be solutions driven, obsess about opportunity, collaborate without ego, maximize your strengths, bounce back with passion. There's not a day where I don't speak about a a number of times, whether it's the way that you communicate why something's important, uh, why a decision was made, how it was made. You can communicate through your, the language of your mission, the language of your values, whether it's in the reviews, in the reviews, we ask, how does this person live up to our mission and, and our values uh, with specifics? And that, that's a, a second way to do it. And then in, in the way that you reward people uh, and, and encourage people, it, you just, it's using that language. I found that to be the most effective. And when you start seeing, you know, we have something called learn from reality, which is one of my favorite principles. It means the greatest advantage you have in life is the speed at which you learn. So you have to learn fast. And how do you learn fast? You look to your left, you look to your right, and you stand on the shoulder of of giants. There's so much to learn from great companies and and from your customers. And we call it, the acronym is LFR, you know, learn from reality. In, I probably get 500 emails a day. I would say the, the, the acronym LFR is in probably 30 to 50 every day. It's like, what's the LFR there? That to me is how I know if we're successful. If people are speaking, using the language of our our mission and our our values in their communications. Yeah, how it shows up in the everyday, right? Showing up consistently all around you. There's a line, Robert, in the book that totally, it jumped out to me because it was framed up so differently the way you talked about it. You said values aren't what you say, they're who you fire. What, what do you mean by that? That's good stuff. Yeah, look, I, I learned a, a, a lesson uh, early on when we started hiring these traditional agents. Most agents are absolutely amazing, wonderful, entrepreneurial human beings, really caring. They care a lot about their community. Um, but every once in a while, like in every, you know, every, any industry of 2 million people, there, there's some bad apples. We hired a, a bad apple who created a somewhere between toxic and abusive environment. And I realized that in the first week. And one of our employees, a, a woman I care deeply about, uh, who was there early with us, said, you know, she called me w- one night. And she said, I just can't take it anymore. This, this person is too difficult. And she wasn't crying, but I could feel it close to that. And so I decided that night that we had to you know, fire this agent the next morning. At the time, that was not an easy thing to do, like, w- because I knew there would be press around it. And I knew um, because our industry is closely watched by trade press. And I knew everyone else would say, oh, something must be wrong with Compass. Uh, that, at least that's why that's I thought. And that would stop people from wanting to come. And so we, we did it. And the next day, I had dozens and dozens of agents. We were small at the time. That was, that was a lot of people back then. Email me and call me and say, I can't believe you did that. You're the first company 
that actually put culture first. This is why I love Compass. I, I realize that these decisions that sometimes that feel really hard around culture, they actually, they're not that hard. <laughs> you know, it, because everyone wants to be around, be a part of a company that's a good company. And you all, you know, when, you know, when someone is a bad culture fit or is all about themselves or is, is, is mean to others and is demeaning to others. And, uh, and this actually made people want to, to work at Compass even more, our employees and agents. To me, that is such a powerful thing because the message that you sent as you spoke to internally was so powerful. And I would imagine that woman is still right beside you by the way. She is. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. What's your approach to recruiting, you know, and hiring talent, right? How do you think about that as uh, particularly, you know, early on, right? When you were trying to attract top talent. The idea of talent was one, obviously has to be talent. Two, has to be people that bring energy to the company. Don't take it away. When you're a startup, like one of your greatest assets that you have to depend most on is positive energy. You have to protect that. And you're, you're too small and one, one person can bring down everybody else and you're all working towards a vision that hasn't happened yet. So you need positive energy to, to bring people together, to work hard, to build something that doesn't yet exist. So that, that'd be the second. And then third, the kinds of people that would attract more people. Uh, and so, you know, Ori alone, as an example, having sold a company at Google, another at Twitter, I knew that he would be able to hire top talent and we, we, we would need that talent to hire you know, more top talent because of, again, at the end of the day, all you are is a collection of people that are, that are building something that doesn't exist. And it's important as well to, to give that, that early group equity. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is early on is they want to keep all the equity for themselves. Uh, you, you really want to give equity because when we pivoted that team, early team didn't have meaningful equity, they would have all left and just been me and Ori. Sure. Right? But, <laughs> sure. They, but, they, but they had equity, which, which made them want to continue work to build, you know, the, you know, the second version of who we were. And so I think that, that's another important lesson learned. You know, Robert, you talk a lot about investing in relationships, right? You're a, you're big on handwritten notes, right? You call every new team member that joins Compass. Talk about some of the ways that you build relationships Right. And why you believe, right, I do too, so strongly, why it matters so much. Well, you know, our fifth entrepreneurship principle is obsessed about opportunity. And I don't know if there's an, an action that I take that has a higher impact per second than calling someone to welcome them on their first day. I did it just because I thought it was the right thing to do. <laughs> like that's how it started. <laughs> right. But then I, I started to see like how much it meant to people. And the, the bigger you get that it gets, I think it actually, the more it means to people because they're more surprised that it's me. I mean, I text, like, I'm just a guy, right? I'm just doing my thing. I'm just working. I'm an entrepreneur. And I just want to treat people the way that I'd want to be treated. And, but these things that make people very happy, you know, I, I think it, it, it matters. And that's why I do that. The handwritten thank you notes. I was working for Vernon Jordan, the late Vernon Jordan, and, you know, one of my greatest mentors. And the first time I met him, he was at Lazard. I meet with him for 30 minutes. I go back to my office. Vernon Jordan was Bill Clinton's best friend. Uh, he was a leader in the civil rights movement. He, he is on more Fortune 500 board than anyone in the history of the United States. He was a really special human being. And he, uh, you know, his assistant calls me after I get back and I write a, an, an email saying thank you for meeting with me. And she said, you, know, you don't do that to Mr. Jordan. I was like, oh, oh I'm sorry. What do I do? <laughs> she, she brought me downstairs. Her name was Jeannie. She brought me downstairs uh, to the bottom of 50 Rockefeller uh, Center, and there was a cranes envelope store. And she, we buy some cranes envelopes, and I write a handwritten note. And, and then I did it to some other people, and I realized kind of similar to the phone calls, uh, it has had such a big impact. And the more that people are going digital, I think the more just some of these human experiences uh, stand out. And I was always trying to stand out to show that I care. I believe caring can by itself is a com huge competitive advantage uh, because people want to work with people that really, really care. You know, Robert, I mean, you've worked in finance, right? You've worked for the White House. You've launched a nonprofit that went national, and now you're running a booming real estate tech company. What's the commonality in all of this? The commonality would be big dreams. 
your dreams are the cap to your potential. You're never going to be bigger than your dreams. Surrounding myself with people that would help me uh, pursue those dreams. I've benefited from more mentors than anyone else that I know. And, and they've just given me so much advice on each step of, of, of how to make that dream successful. Yeah, and so I, I think, yeah, the, the, the commonality are pushing myself to dream big when it's, you know, you know, a lot of people, it surprised me as over time that how many people are actually scared to dream big because they don't want to fail. Yeah, and I, I think because of my mom seeing her fail so many times and bounce back and because of myself, well, you know, I was a C student in high school and college. Uh, I failed many, many times out of college. I, I didn't get one job I wanted in investment banking. Everyone rejected me. But then I figured out uh, a path to applying for McKinsey and I got into McKinsey. So I failed many more times than I've succeeded. You know, remember, Compass failed. We pivoted. But I think I got so good at, at fa failing and bouncing back, it allowed me to dream bigger and not even worry if something doesn't work. Just keep moving forward. Sure. You know, mentorship's a big theme in your life, right? What What's some of the best advice you've ever received from mentors? The best learning that I ever had, and this is something where I really wish uh, everyone listening to this right now could internalize and live, is that feedback is a gift. There was a, a woman named Linda Mornell who was a head of a nonprofit called Summer Search. I was a student in seven nonprofits when I was young because my mom didn't have anything. It was just her. And she's working, so she helped me apply to seven nonprofits to um, to give me the extended family and support that she couldn't provide. And this woman, Linda, she would give me the hard feedback. Then she told me that you know, I'm going to tell you things that others won't. I'm going to give you the feedback and tell you things that other people won't say. And I realized over time that particularly when you're part of an underrepresented community, you're not going to get the feedback. <laughs> And you have to make yourself, you know how it is, sure, right? You, you, sure. you, have, you have to make yourself incredibly vulnerable uh, and, and ask for the feedback and say, you know, please, can you give me more? Can you give me more? Uh, tell me more of you know, what I'm doing well that I should start doing. Tell me what I'm doing that I should stop doing or what I should, what I am doing that I should continue doing. Just please, in, in as many ways as possible, give me this feedback. Because you know, the title of this book is No One Succeeds Alone. It doesn't just mean like, you know, people coming together and, saying kumbaya and just moving forward with passion. Yes, it does mean that. It also means you, you need other people to give to tell you what you need to do. And that's not all going to be positive or it's going to be very negative. And then lastly, what I realized is the more I got feedback from people, you could call it advice or feedback. Feedback just tends to sound more constructive. The more invested they were in my success. And so... American need you? I didn't think of that name. I asked tons of people, like, what do you think the right name is? Uh, the logo of American need you? I didn't do it. You know, I asked, you know, four designers, hey, can you give us your best designs? I sent it out to everyone. We had a hundred, you know, we had all these people like rated, you know, on a survey. And then that's how we selected it. Like I try, I I've actually tried to crowdsource my paths to success. Like, am I building the platform of Compass? You know, I actually judge my success by how little how little of the ideas that may compass I come up with. But like success should be how many people can I bring together to collaborate, give feedback, give, uh, give ideas, and can crowdsource which ones are the best, and then invest in that. And I think a lot of people, their ego gets in the way. Look, my father, right? My father couldn't get the feedback that he wasn't successful in the thing that he wanted to be successful in. And that led him towards a path of being addicted to drugs. Um, and uh, it's or a, a negative life path. And you know how many people in their review, when they get feedback, they start being defensive. Oh, well, what about this? What about that? That's not going to help you at all. Get as much feedback as you possibly can, and that will help you realize your goal, and it will also make those people that are giving you feedback invested in your career. Yeah, yeah. I always love to say, just, you know, turn defensiveness into curiosity. Love it. Right, make that make that pivot. Yeah. You know, the subtitle of your book is learn everything you can from everyone you can. What are some things that you do to to ensure that you are constantly learning and evolving as a leader? I mean, I'm sure it's an endless list, right? But maybe give our listeners some of the ways that you lean into learning. When I was younger, the the way that I would learn, 
<laughs> like I didn't have any mentors. I, I didn't have, there weren't podcasts back then. Right. And what I would do is I, I looked at all the bios of the most successful people. Uh, like, you know, there are a couple paragraph bios on a, uh, could be on a website. And I highlighted in yellow all the things that uh, I potentially could see myself doing. And in pink, I highlighted all the things that I never even knew of an idea about. And I put that together and it, it made it my aspirational bio. And it wasn't just so, so I can see success. It's also so I could feel the energy of a big dream. So I could get excited by my life. And things came out of that. You know, I ran 50 marathons, one in each state in my 20s to raise a million dollars for the nonprofits I went through as a student. Uh, and the idea came because in one of those bios, someone ran 50 marathons. And someone else you know, raised a million dollars by climbing Mount Everest. Uh, someone else uh, rode a bike cross country with, uh, with his father. And so you know, I ran 50 marathons, one each state to raise a million dollars for nonprofits. And my mom came to almost every one. So it was, I've tried to look around at what other people have done great and say, how can I incorporate that greatness into my life? I do have to dial it back, by the way, because I read, right, these 50 marathons in 50 states. It's unbelievable. How long did that take you, right? And what did you learn about yourself during that process, during that journey? That's amazing. It took me uh, six years. I was doing one a month, uh, approximately. Uh, and what I learned was, one, it surprised me when I sent out the email about this idea. Uh, this this big dream. I'm going to raise fifty. I'm going to raise a million dollars by by running these fifty marathons. It's a website called Running to Support Young Dreams dot you know org or dot com. And um, it surprised me how many people said, "But what if you don't finish? But what if you get injured? You know, you, you're you're telling everyone before you've even done it. Yeah, you know, it kind of surprised me again. It gave me more motivation, but it surprised me. Yeah, you, know, you, you you know, because I could tell you're a part of Team Positivity. Um, you know, pursuit of happiness. Will Smith tells his son, "Look, you, you, you'll, you'll never, you'll never be a basketball player because you're too short." And then you see the son go off to the side, get all sad, and throw the ball down. And then he looks at his son. And he says, "Hey, you don't let anyone tell you you can't pursue your dreams. Not even me. They're going to try to put their own self limits on you, and don't let that happen." That that was a real learning at that moment. That a lot of people do that. The second learning was you have to know what you're running for. If you're dreaming big, you really want to go for it. You need energy. You need passion. And it was hard. By the way, if I didn't tell everyone that I was going to run 50 marathons, I would have quit after the 10th because it's too hard. Accountability. You got it. Exactly. And I made myself accountable. I had to do it. Uh, but what gave me the energy was running, you know, it was the name of the org, running to support young dreams. I don't think the world is fair, right? And it, it makes me very very angry, right? I, I, when, I, when, I, when I see kids not being able to realize their potential, it makes me want to run, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so when I was out there training, you know, almost every day running these marathons, you know, I, I would think about these kids and that I'm not running for myself. You know, that is, you know, running for yourself doesn't give you energy. You know, compass, I'm not running for myself. I'm not working for myself. I'm working for the spirit of entrepreneurship. These agents are all entrepreneurs and they deal with rejection every single day, just like my mom, and they still move forward. And there's never been a company that's worked hard for them to give them the tools they deserve to realize their best self. And that's going to be us, right? And so you, you have to find that thing that really that allows you to, to do extraordinary efforts. In your book, you talk about times in your life where you sit down and stretch out your future. If you were to do that now, what would that include? I think I'm think i thinking you know, with the company going public, I think a, a lot about my, my future now and like, what should it be? You know, and uh, I, I took my first like real vacation, like outside of a holiday um, with my family a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, and I'm on the beach that first day. And I look up at the cloud and I'm like, well, now what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like What's this? I didn't, isn't this the moment I'm supposed to be waiting for? <laughs> Is your, you know, when I think about you know, my future and like, it's, it's a really tough thing. I, I think about like, what is success? What, what is happiness? You know, where do I get energy? What, what is meaning? When I'm on my rocking chair, you know, when I'm 80 years old, hopefully in a beautiful place like San Diego, 
and I'm looking out at the sunset, how can I feel that feeling of content? Like I lived a, a good life. Like I, I put everything out there for what matters. And for me, what matters is helping people realize potential. Like that's whether it, you know, whether it's those kids in America needs you, or I started a charter school, or whether it's uh, it's Compass. There's so many people out there, not everyone, but so many people that want to create a better life for themselves and their families, uh, that want to create a more positive world. The more I could contribute to that, uh, the better. And uh, I'm very thankful that you know, not, not all companies, a lot of companies, what better means, means making people more addicted to, to screens, you know, video games or TV or, or whatever. Uh, you know, or making people more addicted to food with salt and, and sugar. The better we get, the more people are finding the perfect home for that themselves in the perfect neighborhood, in the perfect price point. And the more people that are selling the greatest asset of their, their lives in the easiest way so they can move to, to, their, to their perfect home. And the more agents are able to take care of their families. Remember, this is, this is one of the largest industries, you know, agents of, of single parents because it's one of the few careers that gave people like my mom the flexibility to be with their kids, but enough income to support them. And so, you know, as I think about the future and stretching it out, it's, you know, you know, through Compass and other ways to give back, that's partially what this book is about, um, very largely what this book is for, about, all the proceeds are going to charity as well, is, is how can I contribute to, you know, team positivity right. <laughs> and, and helping create an environment in a world where everyone knows they can realize their potential and has a better path to realizing it. Well, I'm sure not just me, but the world's watching, right, Robert? Because you don't mess around. <laughs> you do not mess around. So it's going to be fun to to watch your tomorrows. So we end with rapid fire. I'm going to hit you with some quick ones and you just fire back. Sound good? Perfect. Introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. What was your first job? DJ. Right on. I love that story, by the way. Who's a mentor in your life? The late Bernard Jordan person who would play you in a movie about your life oh i love that i'm i'd be honored to have will smith <laughs> what's the best advice you've ever received feedback's a gift seek it don't run from it one thing you wish you knew earlier in your life that you uh you really can do anything that you want i, I truly believe that mm -hmm. dream big what is success to you robert helping people realize their potential mm-hmm so the show is called Game Changers. So one last question. What game changer inspires you and why? Lin Manuel Miranda. Uh, he, he is a leader in creating a more inclusive world. You know, love is love is love is love is love. He is a leader in showing that you can be your authentic self. Uh, and he is a leader in standing up for others who can stand up for themselves. And I, I deeply respect him and would, you know, you know, and, and very much look forward to, to, to watching the great things that he does uh, and supporting him in any way possible. Robert, you are a remarkable man. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Robert. What a tremendous leader. Here are three of my favorite takeaways from this episode. Number one, love this one, right? Dream big. When Robert was a kid, his mom tucked him into bed at night. And instead of telling him sweet dreams, she told him dream big. He certainly embraced that mindset. So to everyone out there listening today, guess what? If your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Number two, feedback is a gift. Ego prevents a lot of leaders from receiving valuable and important feedback, right? Inviting feedback requires vulnerability, and that can be scary for people for sure. But here's the thing. Feedback, it's a gift. As Robert said, don't run from it. Seek it out. Good stuff. Number three, obsess about opportunity. Opportunity is everywhere if you look for it. And obsessing about opportunity creates more opportunities. Obsess about opportunity and you'll even start seeing problems as opportunities. Every successful person is obsessed about the opportunities in front of them. 
Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.